Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us for another TRU training and education series. Today we're going to be talking about Rugby Sevens, which is excellent since we're all hoping to get back to that uh, when this quarantine ends. I've got Julie McCoy on me. She is a TRU Hall of Famer, former USA Sevens coach, the current founder and director of rugby at American Rugby Pro Training Center, as well as Richard Chadwick, the director of rugby for Northeast Academy and the youth and high school director of ARPTC. Thanks for coming on with me, guys. Glad to be here. Hello, how you doing? Awesome. So starting off with Rugby Sevens, what what kind of players do you need on a sevens team? Fast Riz, one. what's your number one? Riz, give me your number one. What's your number one? Uh, what kind of players do I want on a sevens team? Uh, intelligent players. You want intelligent so, ones? In my intelligent one players. Is, mine is willing. Will. <laughs> Hard sport. So you got to sign up and stay in. So that's number two. So, so two things, right? Two things, Riz, that we agree on. It's not really about rugby skills yet, is it? No, no, no. Not right, yet. right, right, right. Awesome. All right. So and, uh, I like, when we get down to brass tacks, you know, I think that, Riz, you can probably agree that after we get through the willing, intelligent folks, we probably agree on the usual suspects, which is pace, acceleration, deceleration, work rate. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, um, you know, when we're looking at the sevens game, it's, uh, it's obviously all about, um, space and speed um so if you've got players that have got natural speed and natural agility um you're gonna have you're gonna have a, a little bit more success so you, I, i've too. heard that i've heard that you want like you got to have some of the fast people's people but then you also have bigger players that like everyone's got a different focus now is that like one school of thinking or do you want everyone to be able to do everything what do you got do you have like specific fast players like finishers maybe or i mean what do you yeah, got so I, I i break them down into um three three basic categories and then within that there's some categories but the basic categories to me are a warrior um a distributor and a finisher so the warrior would be somebody who does uh, the hard yards. They do the dirty work on the floor. They win the ball back for you. Uh, distributors are obviously the ones with the skill set, the playmakers. And then the finishers are the ones with the pace or the agility to actually score the tries. So if we, if we were to look at that from a, um, it, let's, let's look at the USA men's seventh team. You've got Danny Barrett uh, as your warrior. You've got Madison Hughes as your uh, distributor. And you've got um, Perry Baker as your finisher. Um, and then obviously what you need is a balance of those types of players, because if you've just got uh, seven warriors on the field, you're going to struggle um, to move the ball and to actually score some tries. If you've got a team of Perry Bakers, then you're never going to win the ball. Uh, and if you've got a team of Madison Hughes, then who's he going to pass to? Um, so that's, that's for me, is the, the, the basic foundation of what you're looking for in terms of the roles of a sevens uh, team. And, you know, it's curious, Riz, you know, you use those terms, and this is an example of how coaches come up with their own terms for the same thing. In the old school days with Amos Cygnus, we used to, he used to call them um, uh, fetchers, or your warriors, right? He called them creators, your uh, distributors, and he yep. called them finishers, which, you know, I guess it's the same thing, right? But, but in general, uh, those are, those are skill sets that you lead with, but in, as a coach, you still have to make sure that each player has those other skill sets. So if they're put in, if you're a warrior and you need to be able to finish, you need to learn how to finish your way. So you have to teach that if you're a finisher. Okay. And you have a two on one in the a, a player following you've got you've got to be able to make that play so so these broad categories are just the the the, the major attributes of a, a general uh, general attribute of the of the particular uh, group of players but not that we don't try to teach players everything I remember I had a kid one time who said Jules you keep telling me I'm a finisher I'm not I'm a creator and she spent 20 years trying to become a creator, even though her God-given talent was a finisher. It's an example of telling a woman what she isn't. You know, that's what happens, right, Kat? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, oh. so you've got room for anybody 
like any player can be a good sevens player as long as they're willing to put in that time and effort. Um, so it's like, you don't have to automatically fall into any category to start as long as you're going to put the effort and time in, you can kind of make your way. Yeah, I think, I think there's, um, so if you look at, if you look at rugby at the basic level, it's catch, pass, tackle, run, right? And so if you've got the ability to catch, pass, tackle and run, you can play sport at any level or rugby at any level. Um, once you get higher up the, uh, the ranks or the, the player pathway, um, you start to fall into more of a category of types of player um, because you can't always be a jack of all trades. Um, you, you do have a high skill level at the top level. You do have a good intelligence. You've got good fitness, obviously. But those roles start to become a lot more apparent. When we're looking at the community level, um, you know, there's no reason why a winger cannot be a prop in sevens as well. So if you've got a fast prop, that's going to give you more an advantage, uh, you know, having a fast prop and a winger. Um, that's that's completely fine. As long as you've got those catch, pass, tackle, run um, kind of skill sets down, you'd, you'd be good. Awesome. So since we're talking about prop swingers, um, what's what's the big difference between sevens and fifteens, both as what type of game is it and how can your skills transfer between one and the other? Do you also want to, hit, do you want to start with this sure. one? Sure. Well, I, I would say probably the biggest uh, di difference for me is, is that in sevens, you, you tend to play more. Uh, there's more roles on the field rather than positions. You know, in 15s, everything, there, there's many specialty positions. Um, um, and uh, that requires a, a large number of specific coaches to help with that. In sevens, uh, once you get your uh, your band of willing, intelligent, uh, well well skilled, <laughs> well rounded athletes, then you really only need one coach, and you just play the game that's in front of you. Like if someone needs to clear out and you're a wing, you clear out. If you if you need to lift in the line out, you lift in the line out. If you have to kick it through, you kick it through. So it's a what it's what the game needs of you in sevens rather than. In 15s, with the smaller, I would say, micro spaces rather than macro spaces, uh, you've you've got more shared responsibility because there's more, more players on the field. That that's how I would see the difference, the biggest difference. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, I think I think the, the biggest difference for me is space and time um, for the players in their decision making factors. I think um, a lot of the time in 15s, you've got pretty much two decisions: it's pass the ball early or run into contact. Um, and they're basically the, the two major uh, decisions that you have in sevens because you've got a little bit more time and a little bit more space. I think you've got a little bit more of an option what you want to do with the ball, um, whether it's a, you know, a step, whether it's a kick, whether it's a, a dummy pass or, um, you know, a longer pass or a shorter pass. I think the, the options are a little bit more uh, available to you in a sevens field because you have that time. Um, but as you see on the, circuit, on the, on the World Series circuit, Defense is now becoming a lot uh, more advanced. It's um, it's coming a lot faster at you, so that that time and that space is actually starting to disappear a little bit. So the skill set needs to be better in order to get that time and space again. Whereas in the 15s, everything is played on the on the game line these days, um, and you know the skill sets are really high there. But it's very much around the tactics and moving the defense versus. Um, trying to find that space uh, as, as soon as you have the ball. So uh, I'm hearing like as a player that game knowledge and the ability to make those decisions is a lot greater in sevens than in 15s, which is really interesting. How would you say um, fitness is different between sevens and 15s? Is it different no. from it? different players I don't know like how can a lose I think so I, yeah so I think I think you've the, the the biggest difference there is that you've got op opportunities to hide in a 15s game right so you, you're able to hit a rook or be tackled or make a tackle slowly get to your feet um, and then the other 14 players will will cover your position or cover your role or job um, whereas in sevens if if you take a back foot if you take a pause or a break or a rest that's going to be a difference between a try or no try um, so I think in terms of the fitness, um, you have to be conditioned in order to play for seven minutes at a time. Um, and you have to be able to play for seven minutes at your maximum. 
um, any kind of error, any kind of stoppage or respite, um, you're gonna you're gonna either concede a try or you know make a mistake with the ball. Uh, whereas in 15s, I think you get a bit more of a rest because you've got that many many more players that can help you. I used to say that uh, you'll appreciate this, Ridge, since I'm an old Arkansas coach. I used to say that in sevens, basically, you every player is their own auto forward or auto number seven. So if you get caught, you got to take care of yourself. So uh, um, in fifteens, if you get caught, you that's not as as big deal because you've got a few players with you almost all the time. So uh, in the sevens fitness requirement requirement is the ability to get up off the floor and stay on your feet for uh, as long as you can. We're in 15s. There are more places where you can kind of rest in the game because there's more players. So um, um, getting your mind around the idea that you're all you've got, so you better be prepared for being that um, is uh, tells you how willing you need to be to finish through this whole seven season because it's hard. Yeah, definitely. and. And what do you think about the mindset of a sevens player in the context of like trusting their teammates? Because that sounds like that would have to be a lot more than in fifteens. Yeah, I think I think trust is Everything. trust is an interesting one, and yeah. um, I think you you build trust, um, especially in the training sessions that you do. Uh, you know, you, you go through. Ideally, the training sessions are a lot harder than the game itself, uh, and that physical um, that physical demand in the training sessions builds that trust amongst the players. And if you if you see that the players around you are, as as Jules says, willing, um, then that trust grows with that. And so, if you've got a training session where you are putting the players through some hardship and some um, some gains with fatigue and things like that, and you see the effort that the other players are putting in. You start to build that trust. Uh, so when you get on the field, you know that you've got seven players, you've got a squad of 12 that you trust in uh, because they've all been willing to put the work in the way you have. Um, so I think, I think that what, that's what comes from that there. Yes, I agree. Uh, I agree with the ratio 100%. I also think that um, there's some ways you can build trust outside the game too through some mental skills, uh, um, through, through a mental skills coach. Uh, to work out the kinks of uh, uh, because there's going to be kinks, right? I mean, there's always there's always that in a in a in a well-oiled machine or a battery uh, a battalion of sevens because uh, it's a hard thing. So you lose you lose patience sometimes, and uh, you lose trust from time to time, and you need to be able to repair that in order to work well as a unit. You know, connection itself, the word connection. Uh, comes first rather than trust. You must be connected. You must feel connected to your teammates before you trust them. Um, so there's a whole bit of work off the field also that that really needs to be put uh, uh, to for, for us to attend to as coaches, uh, not just depending on uh, the battle situations to build that trust and rapport. Um, yeah. You, yeah, you know me. Awesome. I mean, you guys also just perfectly cued into our next our next point how how can you plan an effective sevens practice so a lot of the stuff that you're you're mentioning about you know putting the athletes really through it together builds that trust or building trust off the field what are some hints you have for how to build effective practices um game situation practices or just like team building what do you guys do Rich, go first sure um, I think so an effective practice is you have to include certain components. So obviously there needs to be a warm up and some sort of mobility and um, some sort of um, something to get the body prepared for the intensity of the session. And I'm going to come back to that word intensity because I think that's the most important thing. Um, everything that you, sh you do in a training session should be intense unless it's a teaching session. So I typically, if you've got a Tuesday, Thursday kind of setup. Um, Tuesday would be a teaching day. So looking at the weekend and what you did, uh, and that's, that's a lot slower in terms of the, the intensity of it. Uh, and then Thursday is, um, an execution day. So you can ask as many questions as you want and you can talk around so many things on a Tuesday on a Thursday, we're going to execute and we're going to, we're just going to do, um, 
but within that, I, I would say that there's always that, that mobility um, area first and that, that conditioning first. Uh, there's motor skills, uh, which is about catch and pass and learning how to manipulate the ball the way you want it to. You've got cognitive skills, which is all about decision making. And then you've got gameplay. Um, so what, what you have there is, uh, and sorry, and then also a contact element as well. Um, so if you can get those four areas in, which is the, men, the, the motor skills, the cognitive skills, the gameplay, and the, the contact, um, you've got a pretty effective training session there. Typically, I don't think more than an hour is, is needed. Um, so making it really short, sharp, fast, intense is really going to be an effective sevens practice. Um, you know, you can start with some really basic motor skills and just to get them warmed up. Then you can go into cognitive skills, some decision-making, some games where the mind is working. Then you can put them into small-sided games. Uh, it doesn't have to be sevens. It doesn't have to be mul uh, one direction. It could be multi multiple directions. Um, and then just having a com contact element in there as well, whether it's some wrestles, some, uh, you know, some uh, body combat, anything like that. Um, but again, yeah, short, short and sharp and really intense. And I would say also for, you know, if you back up even to a larger view, I mean, uh, how, how and when you build your practice would be, for me, I'm more of a whole part whole type coach, which means that I always bring everybody together to do some sort of game to get them together connected first, connected together with a game. And then I'll go into one of those other elements that Rich spoke to. And always at the end, I always finished with another game or some sort of something that brings the whole group together again, so that they're always, but we're always start trying to practice starting with connection and ending with connection. Because in a sevens game, the first kickoff is so important. You have to be switched on and connected in the first second because it's not a very long game. So the times when you need to be switched on or your team needs to be switched on together are at the very beginning and at the very end, because at the very end, there are that those two spots are the parts where you win or lose or re-win the advantage. So uh, I always try to pattern my practices over what I expect during the games because they're so short, right? Rich, your one hour practice with those 14 minute games, right? Yep. Awesome. Do you guys do anything or have any um, advice for like, off-field practices, either game review or team building or just not practices, but like what do you do to build the culture for the team? Riz, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, culture's a, culture's, culture is an interesting one, right? It's a, it's a buzzword that we've been using in the rugby community for a long time now. And um, I think it, if we look at culture, it, it's what – what does the team do when the coach isn't looking? Um, and that, that has to be down to the players. And so if we look at what the players can do, you have to be able to empower certain leaders within the team in order to um, fulfill what the team wants or what the coach wants or what the players want. Um, so any kind of activities that, as Jules talked about, brings the team together, uh, puts them through scenarios or through environments where they have to, uh, problem solve or play games to each other or connect with each other in a personal manner um, are all really cool things to do. Um, even if they're like silly little games that you can do around, you know, have, having a team meal and, you, you know, you, you're playing silly, silly games that you can do. Um, it's just anything to bring some sort of positivity and laughter and uh, connection with, within the players. And, you know, um, you know, historically speaking, uh, for club level rugby, uh, in, in the years past, it's always been two practices a week, uh, you know, game on Saturday and the drink up on Saturday night. And the drink up would always be the way you connected. And, uh, you know, Riz and I have moved on from the club, uh, that type of uh, activity as a way to, to, to build culture with – with the players and the coaches. Uh, yes, that's what, that's what a lot of rugby was started as, but it's not how it's, it's finished up. So at the club level, you have to make a decision whether that's going to be the way you're going to set your culture or not. Uh, and if it's not, then you have a lot of opportunities to create other options. So nutrition information, 
S and C uh, workouts together, strength and conditioning workouts condition, core strengthening workouts conditions, uh, pace, uh, you know, sprints together, uh, you know, parklet runs together, um, mental skills um, uh, calls or, or, or practices or exercises. And, and, the, and the higher you get up, the more you want to do that. So more than two days a week. So you really have to kind of get, gear it towards what the players are there for. Are they there for recreation? Because if they're there for recreation, you don't want to try to set up a five day a week, you know, practice schedule and they're just going to be unhappy. They're not there to be unhappy. They're there to find happiness and reduce stress in their lives. On the other hand, you know, maybe they need to come to ARPTC if they're unhappy with uh, just the recreational aspect. Uh, maybe they want to push themselves. Maybe they want a five day, uh, maybe they want six sessions a week, four th strength and conditioning sessions a week, you know, learning how to properly fuel and play in sevens every weekend. Maybe that's what they want. And if they have that, then it's available to them. Um, so you can see it runs the gamut based on what the players want uh, and why they are there. That's awesome. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I'm glad because I try to make sense as much as possible, Kat. <laughs> I, was like, I don't always do it, but I like, oh tried it on that one. I get it now. <laughs> Um, my last, sorry, I'm like mind blown over here. Um, my last question is what can a player practice on their own to be better at seven? So if they're out there, they have a goal. They're like, I want to be the best sevens player I can be. What is something that is a controllable for themselves? Like what can they do in order to be yeah, better? I mean, I think this is, um, so when, when we look at what coaches look at in order of selections, um, we look at four, four major areas. Uh, we look at the physical abilities, we look at their technical skills, we look at their tactical understanding, and we look at their mental capacity. Okay, so are you able to read books about mental toughness? Are you able to do um, men, uh, you know, emotional intelligence tests? Are you able to learn about yourself mentally? Absolutely. So get reading books, get, get understanding mental toughness and how you can practice it. Can you work on your own technical skills with a ball one-on-one -on -one, or just on your own? Absolutely. Whether it's a catch pass, kicking, um, you know, anything like that, you absolutely can do that on your own. Tactical understanding, watch sevens games. Don't just watch the ball. Don't just watch highlights. Watch, watch the players that you potentially could be and watch what they do off the ball. 97% of the game is played without the ball in your hand. So don't follow the ball follow the players and what they do on and off the field in that sense or off the ball, sorry. And then the last part is the physical, which is something that you absolutely can control and you can control that within a six, four to six week period. Get powerful, get strong, get fit, get fast. Uh, look at your diet, look at your sleep, look at your recovery. All of those things are in your control and are very, very easy to, to, um, to maintain as well. So that'll be my answer to that. Yeah, and it's just related to your level of dedication and, you know, on the recreation versus Olympic scale and and how much you enjoy it. I mean, you know, I mean, some players just love to be fit and strong and they work on their kicks or their footwork um, and they love it. I mean, it, it keeps them happy and healthy. And some players, you know, uh, just want to show up on Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturdays. And that's fine, too. It's a rugby. You you know, rugby's there for everybody. There's a little bit of something for you. So, um, so I, I, can, I can't even imagine not wanting to be fit for rugby. I don't know that uh, as a player I ever was. I, 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 that's misery to me. Um, it, it'd be miserable. It'd make it a lot easier. I used, to, I used to tell, I tell the girls all the time, I say, you know, we got to practice misery because the truth is, is that we're all miserable. They don't look miserable. When, they're, when you're watching them on the television, you're like, God, they look, look so effortless. But I promise you, they are <laughs> miserable. They feel terrible. But you know, the difference is, is that they are doing it anyway. It's hard. So, so you have to practice that misery if you want to be the best. Um, and so that, that, that cannot be coach-led only.
it's got to, you've got to be able to figure out what you're going to give to the game and what you're, what kind of amount of time you're going to put in to yourself uh, off, off, away from the coaches. So, I mean, again, um, I think that, that Ridge is right. I think that when we make selections, or at least for me, it was more about what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing on your own? Um, you know, how, how bad do you want this? Um, you know what I mean? I'd rather have a player, a B side, a B plus player with an A side mind than an A side player that was lazy. Uh, because at the end of the day, the team itself matters more than the individual. So, um, it, you know, we can get to selections on your next podcast, um, but I'll, I will not go down that road today. Um, uh, Rish, yeah. Agree? Don't you agree? Do you have any, any final words, Rish? Uh No. Nope. I mean, this has been awesome. It's, you're – as an individual player, I think there's a lot to take away from this. Mostly misery is what I'm hearing. Um, but as like a coach as well, it's, it's all got to be for the players. Like you got to figure out what your players want, what they're willing to put in. And as a coach, you shouldn't be trying to coach a high performance side. If you've got a 12 people that really want to be social, you can't force anyone to do something that they don't want to do. So I think that's really awesome. Um, I really want to thank you guys for coming on with me today, uh, especially since I know Sevens is at the forefront of everyone's mind because we're just keen to get back to it. Um, so I appreciate the time. And I, if you have any closing remarks about Sevens or rugby or coronavirus. <laughs> I, would like, I would like to say that uh, we uh, to thank you, Kat, for having Riz and I on from American Rugby Pro Training Center and that – uh, to go to our uh, Facebook page and uh, American Rugby Pro uh, Facebook page and our uh, website, www.americanrugbypro.com. We have a lot of option, uh, offered opportunities for high school residency. We have um, coach development weeks uh, uh, listed on there uh, that, Ridge, that Ridge runs, uh, which would be useful, extremely useful, especially for regional coaches. Uh, we've got our own high school girls Falcon Sevens tournament uh, we, on, on the schedule. And, of course, we have our adult residency uh, with options to play into international tours. So if there is a player out there that, that wants more than two days a week at training, uh, we'd love to have you out and uh, take a look at, at you and see if you fit um, our culture and whether, whether, whether we think we can help you uh, get what you want. Um, so uh, uh, we're, we're here, this is our sixth year, Kat, and uh, we, we're really trying to help the USA win a medal in Tokyo 2021. <laughs> I, right, I guess since it's not 2020, but that's awesome. Well, again, yep. thank you guys and uh, have a great rest of your, your day. All right, you got you too, Kat. Take care, man. Thanks for having us.